Failure is the vanguard of success. The avenues of endeavor herald discovery. But this path has no end. In this episode of Above and Beyond, we celebrate a remarkable milestone. With over 100 successful shuttle flights now behind us, it's time to examine the machines, men and women who've propelled us to such great heights, time and time again. But our first story today takes us back to the very beginnings of time. Of all the mysteries that scientists investigate, the greatest riddle is life itself. What caused a planet like Earth to form around our sun? What sparked chemicals to burst forth into life? To help answer these questions, astronomers are studying celestial fossils from the solar system's earliest times. The planets and the sun were created four and a half billion years ago from a whirling cloud of dust and gas. Heat from the young sun and the pressure of the solar wind swept clean nearby planets like the Earth. But farther away, the cold outer regions preserved giant gas balls like Jupiter and Saturn. Comets were to remain frozen fossils, holding secrets of the chemical makeup of the solar system's birth. Life itself is found only on Earth, but clues to its origin may be found in the distant reaches of giant planets, moons and comets. The NASA missions to the outer solar system are named Comet Rendezvous Asteroid Flyby, or CRAF, and Cassini. CRAF and Cassini are the first missions in Mariner Mark II, a new series of spacecraft being designed to explore the furthest reaches. Comets in the outer solar system are likely composed of the same primitive chemicals as the ancient nebula of gas and dust that formed the Sun. In 1986, a fleet of international spacecraft tracked Halley's Comet and revealed a snowball of dust and ice and a hint of organic compounds. In 1995, Kraft was launched to a typical comet named Koff. On its outward flight, the spacecraft first investigated an asteroid, and in August 2000, it reached its destination. As craft travels alongside the comet, it fires a penetrator lander equipped with a laboratory of instruments. These instruments are designed to sample chemicals that could be relics of an era billions of years old. What are the chemical missing links in Earth's past? While Kraft studies the comet for three years, Cassini's search will take it to Saturn. Cassini is an international mission that teams an orbiter spacecraft built by NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory with a probe provided by the European Space Agency, ESA. Cassini was named for the 17th century astronomer Jean-Dominique Cassini. Here in the Paris Observatory, he discovered four of Saturn's moons and the division in the planet's rings. Here you can see in Cassini's own handwritten notes where he jotted down his amazing discoveries. The spacecraft Cassini will orbit Saturn for at least three years, giving scientists an extended look at the ringed planet and its elaborate system of moons. The most tantalizing of those moons is Saturn's largest, Titan. Titan is larger than the planet Mercury and is the only moon with a major atmosphere. In 2002, Cassini will launch its European-built probe to descend to Titan. The 
probe will measure very complex molecules which are expected to be found in Titan's atmosphere. Detailed measurements will confirm that Titan does indeed have a thick nitrogen-methane atmosphere, the chemical precursors to a life-supporting environment. Huge lakes of liquid methane and ethane may also exist on Titan. The probe will analyze compounds on the surface and relay the information back to the orbiting spacecraft. Kraft and Cassini are the new series of spacecraft designed at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory to explore the outer solar system. Launched on expendable rockets, they both feature streamlined designs and operations to save costs. Time has obliterated remnants of the past, the celestial past on the planet we call home. By exploring comets, asteroids, Saturn and its moons, we're looking backwards in time. The astronomical equivalent of being the first to open an ancient vault. It's a quest that may lead us back to our distant beginnings. United States Space Shuttle, the cornerstone of America's space program. With this sophisticated system of aerospace technology, America has a reliable vehicle for the scientific, commercial, and defense communities a vital link to the construction and servicing of the International Space Station. But getting to this point hasn't been easy. From the very first mission in April 1981, when 16 of the vital heat shielding tiles were lost during launch, and 148 were damaged by a pressure wave created by the solid rocket boosters to the 1986 Challenger disaster, which claimed the lives of seven brave souls. NASA has had to adapt, overcome, and redesign the fleet to reach this wondrous milestone. 100 successful space flights. Today the shuttle consists of three major elements, two recoverable and reusable solid rocket boosters, a non-recoverable external tank containing propellant and oxidizer for the main rocket engines, and the orbiter, the ship in which people and equipment challenge the elements of space. The orbiter is built primarily of aluminium and consists of three main components. The fuselage, the wing, and the vertical tail. The fuselage is divided into three sections. The aft fuselage carries the three main and two orbital rocket engines, plus the vertical tail.
the mid-fuselage is the primary load carrying structure containing the payload bay and payload bay doors. The delta wings are attached to the mid-fuselage. The forward fuselage includes the pressurized three-deck crew module with navigational, electronic, flight and payload handling controls as well as environmental systems and viewing windows. The orbiter's aluminium skin is covered by replaceable tiles for thermal insulation during the heat of re-entry. The overall length of the orbiter is 122 feet. It stands 57 feet high with a delta wing which spans 78 feet. Cargo is carried in the payload bay. This compartment, 60 feet long and 15 feet in diameter, carries up to 55,000 pounds. Upon ignition, the shuttle will require more than 7.5 million pounds of thrust. Fed by its external tank, each of its three main engines generates 375,000 pounds of thrust at liftoff, while the two solid rocket boosters produce more than 3 million pounds each. Two pods on either side of the aft fuselage hold the orbital maneuvering subsystem. Fuel tanks carry nearly 24,000 pounds of propellant and oxidizer. Each engine is capable of 6,000 pounds of thrust. Once assembly is complete, the entire shuttle stack, including the launch platform, is moved to the pad in the vertical position. It's carried on the same crawler transportation system which carried the Saturn V moon rockets to the launch pad. On the pad, the shuttle stands poised for its orbital voyage. At T minus six seconds, the orbiter's main engines ignite with the shuttle still bolted to the launch pad. The astronauts experience a rocking effect as the stack sways slightly. Seconds later, the solid rocket boosters explode into life. The bolts release and the shuttle rises on a column of flame towards orbit. During launch, the crew will experience no more than three Gs. Two minutes later, with the shuttle moving over 2,700 miles per hour, the boosters are jettisoned for recovery at sea. At eight and a half minutes, the main engine's cut off and the external tank is jettisoned. It will not be recovered. At this point, the orbiter is at an altitude of about 70 miles. Once the orbiter reaches its highest altitude, the orbital maneuvering system boosts the ship into a circular orbit. 
the system also provides thrust for major orbital adjustment maneuvers, rendezvous, and deorbit. The burn to leave orbit and re-enter the atmosphere. To change attitude or point the orbiter, the reaction control subsystem is used. These small steering jets are also used for translations and as backup to the orbital maneuvering system. They're located in the two tail pods and in the forward fuselage. On achieving orbit, two Freon loops cool the orbiter's radiator located on the inner door panels to provide cooling for the ship's systems. Without this system, the orbiter could only withstand three orbits. After cooling, the payload bay doors are open. From the payload bay to the crew compartment, the shuttle was designed to achieve the most economical use of space. The crew compartment consists of three levels. The mid-deck contains the living area, 95% of the onboard storage. Then we have the airlock, the airlock hatch, and the waste management facilities. Sleeping accommodations and optional seating for up to three crew members are also found on the mid-deck. The mid-deck also contains a galley for the preparation of hot meals. A crawl space beneath the mid-deck contains environmental control equipment including oxygen, water and other subsystems. Above the mid-deck is the flight deck. Here, as many as four crew members can be seated during launch. The controls for piloting the orbiter in space or atmospheric flight are located on the forward flight deck. Control may be either manual or automatic. All navigational and electronic equipment is also found on the forward flight deck. A second flight control panel is located at the aft flight deck. Controls for the payload station as well as the remote maneuvering system are found in the aft flight deck. Using the remote control manipulator arm, the crew is able to place the payload into orbit. The manipulator arm can also be used to bring satellites on board. As many as eight video cameras in the payload bay and on the arm assist the crew with payload operations. Four aft windows also help the crew with payload observation and orbiter positioning. For medical and scientific research missions, the payload bay can be modified by integrating a laboratory module called Space Lab. Higher orbit or deep space probes can be put into a parking orbit with an inertial upper stage booster for on-orbit launches or deploys. Exiting through the airlock, crew members can venture outside the orbiter to provide a variety of tasks. Specially designed spacesuits are worn for protection. Individual manned maneuvering units are also available. Yet even as the crew goes about its daily tasks, another system is at work. The same network of five onboard computers that precisely control the launch and orbit entry sequence also continuously monitor and control the onboard systems. For some functions, such as rendezvous, the system is designed to perform interactively with crew input. This system will also control the orbiter through re-entry until just before touchdown.
With the mission accomplished, and with deorbit preparations made to leave orbit and re-enter the atmosphere, the payload bay doors are closed. In emergencies, a backup manual closing mechanism can be used. The orbital maneuvering subsystem is used for the deorbit burn to head the orbiter back to Earth. Here, as well as during launch, the function of the thermal tile is crucial since re-entry temperatures can reach a searing 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The normal mission duration is seven days, but this has been extended to 13 days in the past on a modified orbiter. Plans to modify the entire fleet of orbiters for longer missions are underway. After touchdown, a drag chute is deployed from the back of the orbiter. The chute was designed to improve braking and steering controls during landings. Once on the ground, the mission is over, but the career of the orbiter goes on. The United States Space Shuttle, a dependable and versatile means of space transportation providing untold benefits to the people of Earth for decades to come. That brings us to the end of this edition. We look forward to your company next time when we take you once more to see what's above and beyond.